my family. Just wanted to let you all know that I miss you and I'm thinking of you and praying for you and your families. Uh, just want to take this time to say Happy Easter to everyone. Even though we aren't together at the church on this Sunday, we still have so much to celebrate. And I'm so thankful for the empty tomb and that he is risen. I pray that you all will celebrate that today. I look forward to seeing all of you again soon. Take care, stay safe, love you guys. Happy Easter, New Life Kids. I wanted you to know that I miss you so much. I miss your energy and your laughter. I hope you're enjoying um, having time to worship with your parents. And I look forward to the time we can worship and play together again. I hope you have a great day. And I love you very much. Happy Easter. New Life, we hate so much that we can't gather together corporately as the body this Easter. But uh, we know that we can gather online and, and worship and make the most of this wonderful day that we call Resurrection Sunday and reflect on all that Jesus has done for us. So from the Miller family, we just wanted to come to you and tell you, what do we want to tell them? Happy, Happy Easter. Easter. We love, we love you. you. We miss you. We miss you. Hey, New Life family. Miss you guys this Easter. Hope everybody's doing well and staying safe. Good morning, New Life from the Childers family. We just want to say that we love you, that we miss you, and we hope that you have a very happy, happy Easter. Easter. Hey, New Life. We just want to wish you guys a happy Easter. We are praying for you guys. We miss you, and we really, really hope to see you again soon. Good morning, New Life. Happy Easter. Uh, it is good to be back with my folks. Uh, I didn't realize how much I missed them. I knew I missed them, but man, uh, as soon as we started playing together, it was like uh, just a big warm blanket around you. I read something on uh, Facebook the other day, and it was talking about how this would be the first Easter we don't celebrate Easter, and I just kind of laughed at that because we celebrate Easter every day. Like This is just a Sunday that marks when he rose, but every day that we live is when we get to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. One of the most famous things that he ever said he, as he hung on the cross was, it is finished. Once and for all, once and for all, you offered up your life for one and all, for one and all, the perfect sacrifice, atoning blood was shed, love conquered when you said. It is finished, it is done, to the world salvation comes, hallelujah, we're alive, hell was silenced when you cried. This King, so mighty and so strong, He is the one, He is the one the earth has waited for. God's remedy for sin with mercy for all men. It is
can tremble the sun bowed its head the veil of the temple was open for man as jesus went down in the cold of the grave defeated the darkness when he overcame the keys of the kingdoms were placed in the hands of children and priests and of fishers and men through all generations his voice will be heard creation resounds victorious words it is finished it is done to the world salvation comes hallelujah we're alive hell was silenced when you cried it is finished it is done now completed the work of love hallelujah he's alive join the song of the ransom
moon and stars that wept The morning sun was dead The Savior of the world was fallen His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse upon Him The final breath he gave His heaven looked away The Son of God was laid in darkness A battle in the grave A war on death was waged The power of hell forever broken The crown Began to shake, the stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death is your sting. I resurrected King. I was ready to you
Father, just thank you so much, Lord, that you sent your son, Jesus, that you sent him to die for us, Lord, and, and to be the price that we can never pay, the price for our sin and our wickedness, Lord, and, and on that cross, his, his blood was shed, Lord, and then three days later, he rose, Jesus he rose, and we thank you so much for that promise that was fulfilled, and we thank you so much for everything that you've done, Lord. And Lord, we pray that even though Easter this year is is different than in years past, Lord, we know that Easter is, is celebrated every day in our hearts. God, again, we just want to thank you so much for the cross and resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. New life. Happy Easter. Who would have thought that we would be gathering this way in 2020? That we would come together via the internet, via Facebook Live, via YouTube, uh, and we would gather in our homes to celebrate Easter in a way that we've never done before. Um, And so I'm just thankful that God has blessed us with a team uh, they can put together and be able to broadcast and, and come to you. And man, wasn't the worship great? Um, I, I just, to be able to have our service per se, though we can't gather together corporately, we can still, <clears throat> we can still watch it. We can still see it. We can still uh, see those uh, people that we're familiar with seeing week in and week out on the stage. Uh, we can still hear those songs that are so near and dear to our faith. And especially this time of year as we celebrate. And so uh, I just want to say happy Easter I uh, mean, my heart longs for the day that we get to get back together and we get to celebrate uh, together corporately as the body. Um, and so we're just going to continue to do some things to try to be as connected as we possibly can uh, during this time. But just know that we here at New Life, we miss you so much. I hope you enjoyed that uh, little video from the staff. Uh, uh, as they just said, Happy Easter. And again, we miss you so very, very much. But we're going to look at the scriptures this morning, and we're going to let God just kind of guide us and direct us and do a work in us. I mean, my hope this morning is this, is that you celebrate around your TV, around your device, whatever it is, however it is that you're uh, watching this morning, that you uh, please, please, with, with everything, and you celebrate the reality of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done in your heart. And I just believe that this could be such a beneficial time for us um, as a church to celebrate in a way that we've never celebrated before. Um, and, and so I just think for me, it's just neat to, to see some of the pictures that I've seen over the last few weeks on, on Facebook of, of families gathered around the TV and to have our church logo on the screen or to have uh, those leading worship that morning up there on the screen and then just commenting with that picture there. I mean, I love to see uh, <clears throat> the church be the church in other places than a building and, and to know that you get to gather around a TV with your family and celebrate this morning the reality of the resurrected Savior just excites me. It excites me. And imagine years down the road, those in your house, how they'll reflect and they'll remember man, how you celebrated and how you led in your home Easter 2020. So this morning as we celebrate, um, if you have your Bibles, you can grab those. Turn to uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Uh, it'll be on the screen if you don't follow along in, in your Bible or on your device. It'll be on the screen as well. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us and then we'll jump in and uh, we'll see what God's got for us. I'm excited uh, to look this morning at, at what God has placed upon my heart uh, for the encouragement of his people and for the edification of his body. So if you join me as we pray. Father, I just pray, God, that you would speak, speak in a mighty, mighty way, God, in these unprecedented times as things as different as we're not getting to experience and do what we normally do uh, as we celebrate Easter. Father, don't let that hinder us. Oh, but God, I pray all the more that you would speak to our hearts and that you would encourage us by way of your Holy Spirit. God, thank you that we can be connected this way. Father, I pray that, that this uh, blesses people's hearts, that this encourages their walk. God, that, it, that even, God, I'm praying even today as we broadcast, uh, God, that, that someone would come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Uh, God, how amazing would it be that, that in uh, Easter 2020, that uh, with as crazy as this world is and this culture is and, and what's happening in our world, that someone would see their desperate need for you and come to faith. So Father, I pray that you awaken in the hearts of people the reality of their great need for you and that you would save and redeem and rescue even today as we celebrate the reality of the empty tomb. 
Jesus, may all this be for your glory and for your honor. In your name we pray. Amen. So to give you a little bit of background to kind of uh, catch you up to where we're going to be here in 1 Peter, you have the Apostle Peter um, who took up his pen 30 years or so after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so he sets himself to, to writing something encouraging to the Christians here in Asia Minor because uh, they're being persecuted. Uh, they're having a lot of persecution come against them and uh, rise up against them. I mean, they were being abused by overbearing bosses is what we're going to see in chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, they're threatened by unbelieving spouses, chapter 3, verses 1. Uh, they're ridiculed by skeptical neighbors and, and associates is what we're going to see in chapter 4, verse 14. And so on the horizon looms a lot of persecution and a lot of uncertainty. And so what does Peter do? He takes to writing and he encourages them. He encourages them what? With the reality of who Jesus is and what he has done. He talks to them about hope. And so that's what I want us to look at this morning. And so by no means am I saying that this world that we're in is like the world that we're going to look at this morning here in 1 Peter. That, that, that's not what I'm saying. I, I know that our current days are hard and our current days are, are difficult. And I believe what Peter has to say to us is going to help point us to some weighty truths that will be able to help us work through these difficult trying times. I, I believe that there are some great um, things that we can glean from the scriptures here this morning as we celebrate Easter. And so the question that I believe needs to be raised for all believers, all believers, the believers here in this day, as well as the believers in our day, that there's this question that we need to look at and we need to answer. And the question is this, how can we have the power of soul in times of great stress and anxiety, not just to endure the day, not just to get through and just to make it, but to be joyful and lose ourselves in the reality of who Jesus Christ it is. So, so how can we live in such a way as not just to barely pull ourselves through, though there'll be days that that happens, that we don't just barely pull ourselves through, but no, we live with a deep-rooted joy and satisfaction in the reality of who Jesus Christ is. How can we do that in times of uncertainty? So, so let, me, let me try to answer that um, let me try to answer that question this morning. And this is what I know. That can only come from something far greater than anything we possess on our own. And so we'll answer that in 1 Peter, starting in verse 3 of chapter 1. Peter pins this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And so the power here, which Peter is uh, uh, aiming to equip these saints, is uh, the power of hope. He's going to dive in and he's going to point to the reality that it's all about hope. If they are or we are going to love like Jesus loved, even in times of great stress, worry, uncertainty, they're facing persecution, we're facing something different, then they must be filled with hope. But what kind of hope? More particular, a living hope is what Peter says. And so my question for us this morning is this, what's hope? What is hope? I mean, you see it on t-shirts, you see it on coffee mugs. The church talks about hope all the time. But, but what is hope really? I, I believe we need to define that. We need to look at that. But before we do, we need to look at what it's not. I believe the best way to answer this question is to go in the reverse and to look at what it's not. So hope in our world is a desire for some future thing which, which may be uncertain or unattainable. It, it's a it's a, it's a desire for something in the future, something down the road, something that's uncertain and may not be attainable. But see, that's not the way that Peter would define hope. That's not the way that the rest of the New Testament, when it looks at hope, when it talks about hope, when it thinks about hope, that, that's not how uh, uh, God would define what hope is. No, church, he would define hope like this, a, a full assurance or strong confidence that God is going to do good for his people in the future. Do you hear that? The difference? I mean, I mean there is full assurance I mean, I stand assured today in the midst of uncertainty and craziness. I, I, have a, I have a confidence and an assurance in something far greater than me, regardless of what happens, regardless of what takes place. That is what biblical hope looks like, knowing that God has got this and that God is in control. But, but there's something even greater about the hope that we're going to look at, the hope that Peter's talking about. 
Because this hope he calls what? A living hope is what we see in the scriptures. And so the opposite of a living hope would be what? A dead hope. And so that just makes me think of what James says over in James chapter 2 when he uses the term dead faith. Dead faith. James 2.26 says this, faith without works is what? It's dead Faith without works is dead. So that means that it's this faith that James is talking about is, is fruitless. It's a fruitless faith. It's an unproductive faith. So really, it's not faith at all. Because faith without works is what is dead. So it's really of no use. It's of no worth. It's of no value. So, so what about hope? What about living hope? See, see, to contrast that, living hope is what Peter is talking about. And living hope would be fertile, fruitful. It would be productive hope is what kind of hope it is. So living hope is a hope that has power that brings about a change in life. Remember the assurance? Remember the certainty of biblical hope? I mean, that's going to bring about a change in someone's life. So, so Christian hope is just, it's a strong confidence in God that he can, has the power to produce and bring about a change in who we are, how we live, circumstances, situations. There's a confidence that's built there, a confidence not on my own, but a confidence in the reality of who Christ is. And so I say things like this often. Uh, I've got two little boys and my uh, little boys like to go outside and play and we like to rough house and we like to do different things. And uh, there's times in the evening whenever I may call them or I may be picking them up and they're like, Dad, what are we going to do this evening? And they want the rundown. They want the scoop of what's going to happen. And I said, all right, boys. I said, we'll do this, this, and this. They're like, oh, what about going? I said, okay, well, I'll try. Dad, you promise? And sometimes I'll promise and sometimes I won't promise because I've come to, to realize something that my promises don't hold much weight because there's a lot of uncertainties that can get in the way. There's a lot of things that can come about. There could be a storm coming. I could get a phone call. There could be a, a crisis that I have to go to. There could be a number of things that happen to arise. And so I don't have much certainty. But as we look at and as we think about this living hope, this hope that's within us because of Christ, God has the power to change. God has the power to, to calm and to, to be over and to speak with certainty and to provide a certainty that we can bank on. So how, how does this happen in a believer's life, this living hope that we're talking about? Where does this come from? How do we obtain it? Because I'm sure everybody would love to have this kind of hope and assurance and a confidence in that it's going to, this future thing's going to happen for me. And so we'll define even more here in a minute what that is. And so let's look at verse 3 as we continue to figure out this, this living hope. He says, verse 3 as he continues, he says, Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There it is. There it is. Church, our hope emerges from being born anew. From being born anew. This new birth comes through what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. We get new birth through what Christ did and what he obtained and how he defeated sin. And so all I know is that there's this big gap between my uh, new birth and the resurrection of Jesus. There's this huge gap. I wasn't there. I didn't see it or experience the resurrection. So how does that connect with me? How does this new birth, this resurrection, how does it connect with you? It's the gospel. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news that has been proclaimed, the good news that has been lived out, the good news of Christ taking on our sin and our shame and dying for us and obtaining what we could never obtain. As a result of that, the good news, the gospel has been proclaimed and that's what bridges the gap. That's what bridges the gap for us. Look, look at verse 23 in this chapter. Flip over just maybe a few pages or scroll down just a little bit. Verse 23 says, Since you have been born again, there's that new birth I've been talking about, born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. We've been born again by the word. God's word is proclaimed and preached, and we hear it, and the Holy Spirit opens up our heart and awakens in us this reality of our great need for Jesus. He, he shows us the state upon which we're in. And the gospel's proclaimed and the gospel's preached. And it's the abiding word of God. Verse 24 it says, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flowers fail, but the word, look, verse 20, but the word of the Lord remains for how long? Forever. 
The word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you, the gospel that was proclaimed to you. It's the gospel message preached in power by way of the Holy Spirit. I mean, Paul, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. He says that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day. That's what we're celebrating this morning. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he rose again on the third day, how according to the scriptures. And so that's the very thing that we celebrate. And I've said this for the last few years that I've had the privilege to preach at this church on Easter and and to pastor and lead you. I've said this for the last few years. We don't celebrate Easter just on April 12th, 2020. Easter is something that's celebrated every moment of every day, church. Like I, I can remember a few weeks ago, I, I saw this little post kind of come through on, on, on my feed on, on Facebook. And, um, and, and I just, I want to be, be gracious and I'll be gentle here as much as I can. But, but, but we, we've got to use our minds and we've got to engage and we've got to be better than this. Because what this says was, was this, and maybe I'm looking too much into it, but, but the, little, the little thing that came through says, Easter is April 12th. Let me be the first to announce it ain't going to get canceled. I've got news for you. Easter isn't just April the 12th. It's the 13th. It's the 14th. It's the 15th. It's May 2nd. It's November 3rd. It's December 14th. It's January 7th. You put a date on the calendar and we get to celebrate the reality that our Savior is alive and well, ruling and reigning. We're not constricted to one date on the calendar. And though the body doesn't get together corporately, we still get to celebrate in this world. We still get to make much of this day as well as every day. We get to proclaim the reality and the truth of what this day, this is just a picture of, of, of who we are. This day, we get to celebrate. We get to remember. That's what this is. Kind of like a birthday, <laughs> like a birthday. We remember that birthday and we celebrate it. But you don't say, okay, well, the next day, they're not that old anymore. No, 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 no they still are. And we're so grateful that they're that age. Same thing with Easter. Jesus is still alive. And the tomb is empty, and we as the church have the privilege and honor to celebrate. <laughs> so back, back, to, back to our scriptures. So, so in verse 3, what we see is that we're born anew through the resurrection of Jesus. But there uh, in verse 23, we're born anew through the living and abiding word. And so the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection is what the gospel is. And that's what springs up in us this reality of our great need for him. The resurrection of Jesus does not produce hope without us first hearing about it. We've got to hear about it. We've got to be made aware of our great need. We've got to be made aware of that reality. So before it can bring hope in our heart, we have to have the good news. It needs to be delivered to us. It needs to be made known to us. Romans talks about that. How will they, how will they save and let, be saved unless they hear? And how will they hear unless someone is sent to proclaim and preach the good news? Um, so I, I was reading an article this week. I was, uh, I was just looking kind of about and reading some articles. And, and this one article, I, I'd heard it, but I wanted to just go check and make sure. Uh, uh, but right now what they're saying is that the sale, the sale of Bibles are uh, at an astronomic high. Uh, I mean, Bibles are flying off the shelves. Like, like I know toilet paper can't stay stocked, but um, I saw a picture the other day of a, of a store. And in the store, the whole Bible section, there was just like two little, little Bibles left there on the, on the shelves that Bibles are just being, being bought a, a, as fast as they can. And so I was reading that article and I was, I was reading about it and just trying to figure out what's going on, what's happening. And, and so this, this is what I come across. It, it says this, the, the life uh, the Ben Mandrill is the Life, uh, Lifeway CEO, and this, this is what he says. He says, people are ordering books online, especially the good book, meaning the Bible. He says, according to sales from top Christian publishers, that's what's taking place. They're ordering, they're getting their hands on, this, on the Bibles. While the vast majority of Americans own Bibles, a large percentage say that they never read it. And so, so what's, what's happened in our culture and our world right now is this, is that there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of worry there's a lot of misunderstanding. And so what are people doing? They're, they're turning back to the one. And, and I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm just simply talking about they're trying to figure out and understand greater. Maybe those who are, have been saved and were just wandering as in or maybe turning back. But, but those that don't have a relationship with Christ are trying to figure out what's going on. 
They want answers. They want to know. There's, there's fear and panic. And, and so what are they doing? They're trying to figure out what's happening, what's taking place. Alabaster Company, a small business in uh, California that sells books of the Bible for kind of this Instagram uh, generation. It's these, these big uh, books of the Bible, and it's kind of more uh, catalog looking and uh, just colorful, and just it'll grab your attention. They said that they saw an increase of 143% compared to last year. Last year at this time, there is an increase in sales of the scriptures through their company by 143%. 62, uh, or LifeWay Christian Resources also saw an increase of 62% last week compared to the previous year. LifeWay, one of the biggest publishing companies uh, for the Christian faith, a 62% increase. The, The CEO says this, he says, we believe this is no accident as people often go to the Bible as a source of hope in times of crisis and uncertainty. That's what he said. He says, people draw hope from the scriptures because in it they see God and they see what God does with us during suffering in times of hopelessness. So people are hungry. Church, church, we have got a great responsibility and opportunity right now, more than ever. As people are anxious, as people are hurting, as people are worried, we know as we've seen this morning where we find our living hope and it's in the reality of what we celebrate today. But the whole world doesn't realize that. The world doesn't get that. No, only those who have been born again, those who have come to faith in Jesus Christ, those who have a relationship with him by way of his redemptive work on the cross. And so for us, man, we've got a great privilege and honor to be able to, to share and tell to our communities, tell our families, tell our, our neighbors, tell those that we uh, work with. Man, this world is hurting and scared And church, we've got the hope within us. We've got the hope. So so hear me, words by themselves don't produce hope. There has to be some assurance that they're true. For me just to say something, you're not just going to take it at face value. You want to make sure that there's some uh, uh, reality behind it, some truth behind it. And so we have to have some evidence that Jesus really did rise from the dead. There has to be something there. Because if the Pharisees and the scribes, if they had been able to produce the body of Jesus on Pentecost, then that would have wrecked everything. That would have disproved and discredited the disciples. <laughs> it would have disproved and discredited who Jesus is. See, that's why Paul, when, when he defined the gospel that we just looked at in 1 Corinthians 15, that's why he went on to say this in verse 4. That after Jesus resurrected, he appeared to Cephas and the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. He says, this is not just made up. This is not just whimsical. This is not just a fable or a story. Or uh, This is so much more. It's rooted in the truth and the reality. Why? Because go ask them. They've seen him. They've seen him with their own eyes. They've experienced him. They've they've been able to, to capture a glimpse of him there. And so this hope that we have as believers comes from hearing what credible testimonies, credible testimony years and years ago of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And so if Jesus defeated death and was raised from the dead, then we had better pay attention and we better live by the things that he says, the things that he did. The resurrection of Jesus gives us hope, but it's not just any kind of hope. It's it's a living hope. And so Jesus defeating death assures us of some things. It assures us this, that he bore my sin on the cross. Jesus defeating death and raising from the dead assures us, gives us that hope, that assurance that he took my sin and my shame upon himself and he did for me what I can never do in a million years, a million acts of kindness, a million great intentions. Jesus defeating death assures us also that God is for me and not against me. Church, we need that today, don't we? We need to know that our God and our Savior is for us and not against us. That this isn't him being mean. This isn't him trying to uh, uh, wear us out or beat us down, maybe for the fact of trying to get us to turn our hearts to him, try to get our attention. God, of course, has allowed this time, and, and he's doing it for our good and for his glory and we've, we've got to process that. We need to have a, a, a deep a foundation upon the reality of who Christ is, who God is, 
and his heart for his people, his heart for this world. We, we need to know that and we need to rest in that. And so then when we do that and we've been awakened by the gospel, we can look at what's taking place in our world and, and, and we can rest assured because we've seen over and over and over that God is for us and not against us. That, that God's greatest desire for us is to come to know him and we come to know him for us to grow in maturity in the reality of who he is and what he's done. And that's what he's doing. And so in moments like this, we can rest assured, we can have that living hope that God is for us, not against us. Jesus defeating death also assures us that, uh, that Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me is alive and is present in every moment of my life. Think about that for a moment. God is here right now. He's in your home. He's with you. He's here with me as I'm preaching and proclaiming. He's with my family. He's with my family in another state. He's with your grandparents. He's with your coworker. God is in the middle of this world and he is active and he is doing. And so let's look at verse four because I believe this helps us understand even further this assurance that we're looking at. Look, look at what else he says or assures us in verse four. He says, to an inheritance that is imperishable. Think about that for a moment. So, so he guarantees the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the empty grave guarantees something here for us that's, I believe, uh, unbelievable. It is, it's amazing <coughs> that we're going to have an inheritance that's what? Imperishable. Imperishable just means that it doesn't decay or is, uh, uh, or is ever enduring. It's not going to perish, go away. An inheritance that's undefiled, that is pure. It's untainted. And it is pure and it is right and it is good. And this inheritance is also unfading. It'll never leave. It's not something that will be revoked. It's not something that will be taken away. It's not something that won't be there any longer. But an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. So as believers, this is what we get, church. We get an inheritance by Jesus defeating the grave. Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate what? We celebrate this. We have a living hope and we have an inheritance. Oh, church, we have an inheritance we have it coming, and we, we possess a little bit now, but we'll possess it fully in the future. And look at this inheritance he talks about. He says, it's kept in heaven for you. Who's you? You as the believers. You as those who have come to faith in the reality of what we celebrate today. Seeing who Jesus Christ is, what we talked about on Good Friday. Feeling the weight of that, your sin crushing you, and God putting you back together through his son. And it's kept in heaven for you. And so that's when we gain full access to this inheritance. It's eternity, eternity with Christ. So my question for you is this, what has God allowed you by his good grace? What has he allowed to happen to you by his good grace in this season of life? The season of the COVID-19. This is what he's done in me. This is what he's reminded me of really, really quickly is, is how small and insignificant I truly am. How minute and how fragile I really am. How frail we are. Man, he, he has reminded me of my desperate need for him every moment of every day. That, that Jesus is what I need, is, is that, that Jesus is what I have to have, that, that I can't make it. That that living hope is Christ. That that living hope is Jesus resurrecting from the dead. That without that, I have nothing. Without that, it's, it's empty. Let's go on and read. Verse 5 says this, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I mean, think about that. The wonder of our hope is that at the same power of God, he keeps us, he keeps this inheritance for us. I mean, I mean what wonder and awe is in that, that, that God sustains it. See, see, who by God's power are being guarded. Guarded here is a, is a military term, and it's used to refer to troops stationed within a city. And so what greater hope could be given to those undergoing persecution in this time, in this day, than the knowledge that God's power guards them from within to preserve them, to keep them for this inheritance, that salvation, and it's gonna be completely revealed when they're in the presence of God. I mean, he is guarding that. He is protecting that. He's doing that for the people in this day as they face immense persecution and uncertainty. And hear me, church, he's doing the same thing for us. God is doing the same thing for us. So as believers this Easter, we've got this. We've got it. 
I mean, we, we may have some struggles and we may uh, have some things that go on in us, but, but man, we can be secure because we have a living hope. We have a certainty. We are secure and set because of everything that God has done. And what the grave, the empty tomb proves is that it's true, is that Jesus isn't just making it up. He didn't just say some things with good intentions and then not fulfill or come through with them. But the empty grave proves to us that Christ is who he said he is. He is who he says he is. We're taken care of. We have an inheritance waiting for us in eternity. And that inheritance is Jesus. Church, that's what we celebrate this morning. That, that when this is all over, when this is all finished, if God calls us home in the middle of this and he requires our life or he allows us to get sick and to struggle through or if he keeps us healthy or he allows us to be diagnosed with something, or, or he allows us not to even be touched. All of this is for God's glory and his honor and it's to remind us and it's to point to us that our living hope is found in Christ and that it comes to full fruition whenever we are before him forever and eternity. That's what our heart should long for. That's what this should do for us all the more. The empty tomb should, should cause us to long all the more for our Savior. And in verse 6, he says this, in this you rejoice, that this is the reality that, that we have a, a Savior that's risen from the dead, that has given uh, uh, um, his uh, believers an inheritance, and is also keeping us guarded, keeping us in that faith and in that reality. So rejoice, in this re you rejoice, uh, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And so what Peter's going to do is he's going to remind these believers that they're going through immense persecution and why God allows it. Look at what he says in verse 7. He says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes through, it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there's two testings here we see in this, two results of that testing. One is that it refines or, or purifies our faith. It refines or purifies our faith. It says, much as gold is refined by the fire when its debris is removed, when it's heated up and it removes the imperfections or the, uh, the trash in it or the, the things that is attached to it. That's what difficulty and trials do for us as a believer. It purifies us. It refines us. And then the second thing that it does is this, is, is trials proves the reality of our faith. Trials prove where we have placed our faith. Difficulty, stress, proves where we've put our faith. Is it in us? Is it in my strengths, my abilities? Or is my faith truly in a resurrected Savior? Am I trusting and hoping and walking in? See, what stress does is it just deepens and strengthens a Christian faith. And it allows its, our works to be put on display. And see, church, church, we have a great responsibility. We have a great privilege to tell this world where our living hope comes from. So don't use this. Don't let this time slip by. Don't overlook. Don't miss out on what God has provided and allowed the circumstances and situations that he has given us in this time of, of, of difficulty. Oh, by all means, I beg of you, press in. Let this world see where your living hope is. If it needs to refine you or if it needs to purify you a little bit, let it do that. Oh, but let it be a time where you get to prove and show your faith and put it into practice. And so now what Peter's gonna do here is he's gonna bring everything that he said so far to these believers that are living in this difficult time to a place of great encouragement. This is what the empty grave of Jesus does for us. Look at what he says in verse eight. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not uh, do not, not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Verse nine, obtaining, it's having, it's getting, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. See, God accomplished salvation through the work of his son and he proves it how? With an empty grave. He proves it with an empty grave. The focus of our faith is not an intellectual knowledge, but it's a relationship rooted in faith. It's not a know who Jesus is. It's a, a walking with and loving and desiring and yearning for who Jesus is in relationship with him. 
So hear me, church, as believers, we can rejoice no matter the circumstances because we get what was promised when the grave was empty. We get salvation and eternal life with Jesus. No matter the trials that you face each day, it only brings us as believers what closer to that final day, that day that we're longing for and looking for is to be with Jesus. And so when they will receive in full that inheritance that has been promised, that's what we get. Us as believers, that's what we look to. That's what we long for. So may this Easter be an Easter that you put on display that living hope that you have that's only found in a relationship with Jesus. And may you put that on display. May you show this world of the great hope that you have within you. May you be reminded that you're secure, that God has has got that, that he is guarding you in that and that he is for you and that he loves you and that he's not gonna leave you, that he's gonna walk with you through every step of whatever it is that you go through, every fear, every worry, every anxiety, every uncertainty. He's gonna walk with you right through it all. So what I wanna do for just a moment before we move into this time of, of taking of communion, man, man, I just maybe for the first time you're watching, maybe you were invited by a friend, maybe you just stumbled across this feed for a moment, but maybe for the first time ever, you've seen yourself in light of who God is, and you've been awakened to the reality of your great need for Jesus. I mean, you've seen yourself as sinful. You know that there's issues and struggles that you just can't get over. This hope that we talk about is not one that would be defined biblically, but more like a uh, maybe it'll happen or hopefully this can take place. Not, you don't talk about hope with certainty like, like we do as believers. And so maybe God has awakened you to that reality. If that's the case, man, I just want to encourage you to believe You don't have to do anything weird. You don't have to do anything like that. Man, all you have to do is put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Say, yes, Jesus, I see that you're the only way. I see that I'm sinful and wicked. And I believe that you are Lord. And I believe that you are Savior. That you've come to rescue and redeem. And that, that you have the right to ask and to say of anything. Anything over our life, you have purchased us. And you just step into that reality with faith and you believe that, that the work of the cross is sufficient, that it's enough, that what Jesus Christ did on the cross appeases a holy, justful God. And you walk in that reality and you believe. And, and I just wanna encourage you this morning, if that's the case, if God is awakening you that reality and you see your great need for him, Man, man, that you would please message us, that you would call us, that you would uh, hit us up on our, on our app, that you would reach out to us here at New Life because we would love to encourage you. We would love to celebrate with you what God did in your heart today. Man, that, that is an amazing, amazing thing. And I know that this is a world that's looking for hope. And, and hear me this morning. Jesus Christ is that hope, and that's what we celebrate. That's where our joy is found and rooted in, the reality of who Christ is and what he's done for us. So if if God has done that at all by way of the Holy Spirit this morning or he has stirred you in any way, man, I beg of you, please, please let us know because we would count it an honor and a privilege to be able to celebrate with you, to reach out to you, to get you some resources to help get you plugged in somewhere so you can grow and mature in your faith and we can answer maybe some of those difficult questions that you have as a result of not really fully knowing and understanding who Christ is. But by all means, please reach out to us. Now, Church, what we're going to do is we're going to celebrate this empty uh, grave. And the way we're going to celebrate it is how we normally celebrate it when, when we're here. And we're going to celebrate it like this. We're going to celebrate it by taking communion. And I know this is weird. I know this is difficult. And this is uh, a bit unorthodox. But, but we are going this morning to participate. And so, man, I, I hope you have your, the elements prepared. And the elements are just simply this. It's just some bread. All this is is just white bread. And this is just some juice. And all I've done is put it in a cup. And so what I would count it a privilege and honor to do this morning is to be able to, to lead you through this time of taking communion. And so I know it's a unique opportunity for us as the church. I mean, family gathering in their homes on Easter Sunday around a TV or a device. I mean, you mean we can take communion in our homes? Absolutely, yes. There is nothing that tells us otherwise. I mean, there's nothing special about the one who gives communion No, it's all about the one whose life has been laid down for us and the one we celebrate during communion. So whether you're a dad, whether you're a single mom, and whether you're a grandparent raising uh, one of your grandchildren, whatever the case is, maybe you're a family of 10, who knows? But man, you 
have the privilege and honor this morning of serving the Lord's table to your family. And so I just want to spend a few minutes allowing you to just, man, look inwardly and sing, man, if there's sin in your life, in your heart, maybe some unrepentant sin, or maybe by, uh, by the sermon this morning, God just kind of stirred your heart. And, and if he has, man, I want to give you some time to just be able to just kind of go before the throne and just pray and seek him. I just want to read a couple of verses to you out of 1 Corinthians 11. This is what it says, 11, Corinthians 11, uh, uh, 27. It says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Verse 29, For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many of you are weak and ill, and some have even died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we will not be judged. So what I want to do this morning is this. I just want us to have us a time of that, just a time of response, just to, to look inwardly and to seek and just ask and say, Jesus, is there anything in me? Is there any sin in me that I need to repent? Is there anything in me that would merit itself coming before the throne and asking you to just break my heart? Church, repentance is a good gift of the Father. Conviction is a good gift of the Father, whereby he stirs in us and makes us aware of, of, of things that's not pleasing to him, that goes against him. That's a, good, that's a good dad to point out our faults, to point out our struggles, and then to stand there with open arms saying, come, oh, just come and tell me about it. Son, daughter, fall at my feet, and man, I will lift you up stronger than ever. So I just want us to do that. I just want us to spend a few minutes. And so I'm going to do that myself. You can do this here in your, your living room with your family. If you want to lead in a prayer, if you just want to just kind of just take a few minutes and just let it be silent. But once uh, I've given a few minutes, then I'll, I'll, I'll just pray for us and then I'll lead us in taking communion. But, but you pray, I'm going to pray myself. Father, we, uh, we just pause now in this moment. And, and God, I, I just can't imagine the sound that you get to hear as your believers cry out to you in this moment. I mean, as they just get to reflect their heart back to you, as they get to focus in on who you are and what you've done. God, the, the reality presented, the truth presented in this message this morning of, of our living hope being found in our new birth and our salvation, which you've provided freely uh, by way of your son on the cross and the empty tomb. And Father, the reality is this, every person that's praying this morning before we partake of the elements of the cross, God, are sinful and in need of repentance. God, every, every day, every day I blow it. Every day I don't do, or every day I do something I shouldn't do. And I just think of what Paul said. And so, Father, just, just in this moment, God, I pray that you break our hearts and you uh, convict us and draw us back to your side. Oh, God, that we would, we would have a holy hatred for sin like you do. So God, please just do a work in us. God, thank you for allowing us to be able, though not to gather corporately, we can still gather this way. And God, how amazing that we get to take communion in our homes this morning. So God, bless this time, maybe for your glory and for your honor. Jesus, we need you. Forgive us of our sin. God, save the lost. Move in a mighty way. In your name we pray, amen. So Paul goes on, and what he's gonna go on, he's gonna, he's gonna say this. Continuing in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do in remembrance of me. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is this, is that you would take the bread. If you need to pass it out to your family, do that. But as Paul said, man, this is the body of Christ. This is what we celebrate this morning. His body broken for us. He took our sin and our shame upon him and he goes to the cross and he dies a death that he doesn't deserve. And so what Paul says, when we gather and we take of the body, we do it in remembrance of that reality. 
So Jesus, help us in this moment to remember all you've done for us. Thank you so much. And we pray. Amen. Take of the body and eat. And he's going to go on in verse 25, and he's going to say this. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Covenant of the new, the new covenant. Jesus' blood was spilled for us. Our sin and shame absorbed in that cross and absorbed in the precious blood of Jesus, and he covers us. So I'm going to ask you now at this moment, if you take the juice and you would distribute it to those in your house or to yourself, that you would take it. And as Paul says here, as often as you do this, when this cup is is taken and you drink of it, you do it in remembrance of who Jesus Christ is and what he's done. So take and drink. Church, look at what he says in verse 26. And think about this. Easter morning in your home as you've taken communion with your family. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, what do you do? You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What you have just done this morning in your home, with your family, in your neighborhood, is that you have proclaimed that Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he is, and he has accomplished exactly what he said he would accomplish by the reality of that grave being empty. You're saying that Jesus Christ is the living Son of God, perfect, spotless Lamb that took our place. I mean, church, how amazing that we celebrate Easter, not in a building, but as a family in our community. So may you remember that this week as you go out and live, that the grave is empty, that the tomb is empty, that Jesus has provided for us a living hope. And may you share that living hope with those in your neighborhood, those in your family, those who you call friends. May you tell them of that hope because, hear me, they won't know unless we tell them. And we've got the great privilege and honor of doing that. And by partaking of communion this morning, you're saying that I'm willing to do it. So may God bless you. May he keep you. May he use you in a mighty way. Happy Easter new life. We can't wait to get back with you. May go and proclaim his life, death, and resurrection. May God bless you. God sent his son. They call him Because he